Hello, Smart People Podcast listeners. Today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter offer code SMART at checkout to get 10% off. Again, that's offer code SMART at checkout. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. The podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello, welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm Chris Stemp. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome episode today. I am excited to introduce you to someone you may not have heard of because she's an up and comer, but she's crushing it. Our guest today is, ready for this? I'm going to pronounce this right. Yvette Dantremont. Yvette Dantremont. Better known as Psy Babe. Okay, she's the science babe. And essentially what she does on her website, cybabe.com, is she's busting pseudoscience with a combination of real science and her undeniable kind of raunchy humor. Particularly, she dedicates her work to the world of food. She's trying to help us cut through the noise, cut through the marketing, and understand what food actually is good for us, bad for us, what's harmful, what additives, organic, not organic fresh, local, all that stuff. Now, if you know anything about my background, you'll know that I am very much into healthy food. The nonprofit I work for is the United States Healthful Food Council, where we try to work towards improving the food system. So look, I eat organic. I eat organic meat. I talk about it in this episode. I buy organic milk. And I don't know, I might still do that. But as we cover in this episode, a lot of the stuff you think is bull. And I say bull without the the secondary part to also really quickly point out there is some swearing in this episode. I don't know how many times. I don't remember. But Psybabe, one of the things she's known for is she has a little bit of a dirty mouth. I'm okay with that, personally. That being said, Psybabe took to the interwebs to really be the opposite of food babe. Okay. So she said, okay, look, you think everyone on the planet has a gluten intolerance? Well, let me tell you the science behind it. Or you think that pumpkin spice lattes from Starbucks are carcinogenic? Let me tell you the science behind it. And she just started this blog, I want to say a year ago, or maybe not even that. And since then, hundreds of thousands of followers, book deal, TV deal, really blown up because of her style, what she covers, and her honesty. We talk a little bit more about her background, but I'll just give you kind of the, the quick and dirty, if you will. Yvette holds a undergrad in chemistry and theater, which she talks about. And then she has a master's in forensic science with a concentration in biological criminalistics. She also worked as a kind of food scientist of some sort at a lab that processed pesticides and things like that. So she really understands the chemical components of food, of a lot of the things that are getting bastardized when it comes to food. And she's trying her best to cut through the marketing nonsense. So enough of me talking about it. We're going to get into a spirited conversation with Yvette, a.k.a. Cybabe. You can check her out on her website or on Twitter at The Cybabe. Also, I just want to give a shout out real quick for anybody who's in the business world, specifically if you work for a nonprofit or an association, check out this new podcast that's out there. It's called Association Labs. It's with JP Murray of The Murray Company. They're quick. 10 to 12 minutes, really great content. For full transparency, this is one of the podcasts that I have helped produce. But for example, episode three, it's brand new, is on sales. It's 10 minutes long, 11 minutes long. Almost anyone needs to know about sales. He gives some really great points and he's a fun guy. 
Go check it out. Association Labs on iTunes. Type it in. Subscribe. Enjoy. All right. You can find us at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Tweet at us at smartpeoplepod. Much love. Here it is, our conversation with Yvette Dontremont, the Cybabe. All right, Yvette, thank you so much for being on the show. I feel like I know you already, even though we've already been, <laughs> only been talking for 15 minutes. But um, luckily, I wasn't recording because that was definitely <laughs> X-rated. Oops. <laughs> but thanks for being on. I, I knew you as Cybabe. And so um, kind of first thing I wanted to talk about is so people know, like, what is the premise of your brand? It's well, I, I like to say come for the science, stay for the dirty jokes. Um, and on my my Facebook page, it says chemist dedicated to the decimation of woo. Mm -hmm. um, woo is another word for bullshit. So and, and no, the number of times people have emailed me saying, you know, decimation is to only reduce by 10 percent. I'm like, yeah, I know if I can personally yeah. get rid of all the bullshit in the world by 10 percent, that's that's not bad because <laughs> that means we only need 10 other people doing my job to get rid of all of it. But oh no matter how much bullshit I get rid of, there's going to be more of it. Like more charlatans are going to show up, more people are going to take their place. So I have to keep on playing a game of whack-a-mole. But more importantly than that, if I can teach people how to recognize the signs of bad science, then it's then people are going to avoid it, and hopefully people aren't going to try to sell it in their place. So I can't just debunk uh, piecemeal. Better than that, I can show people how to avoid bad science and avoid bullshit. Well, after seeing all the bullshit that you see, and like we're going to oh, get man. into a lot of it, but... <laughs> I mean, how like how do you maintain enough belief in humanity to try to teach the masses or at least educate in the best way you can? I think the way that I, I kind of maintain some belief that people are, are good is that the number of times people email me saying, you know, I used to follow the food babe and then I read your blog and went, holy shit, how could I have ever bought into this? Um, or the fact that there are more people following science and more wonderful studies and mm. more, uh, you know, m more cures coming out of science on a regular basis than there are out of this natural cures movement, uh, you know, which doesn't cure a f thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that people are going to buy into this into that kind of alternative medicine thing because, you know, they're searching for good health. Like they might be looking for answers, but they, uh, you know, they get cut off at the pass uh, from good information by bad information. So you go to Google, you know, something on, uh, um, on GMOs or vaccines. And when, you know, when you Google, especially GMOs on the first 10 uh, hits from Google, only two are positive. Only two have reputable information. So I kind of don't blame the people who buy into bad information it's it's not their fault that there's just so much insidious information online yeah. they're just kind of doing the best they can with what, with what they understand as science or not science so i mean it's frustrating for me uh to try to battle this but at the same time like i understand why people don't uh don't get it right so my job is kind of to try to keep on chipping away at it and find a way to get through to people that no 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 here's how science works as opposed to getting frustrated with the fact that there's a lot of bad information online so you know people are vulnerable they're desperate they're trying to make the right decisions with the information available right. let's try to get more information better information and let's try to communicate it in ways that resonate with people so i kind of do that with humor and it seems to be working at least for me yeah and i actually want to get into kind of your meteoric rise but while we're on the, <laughs> while we're on this subject because i deal with this a lot and i'll bring in a personal experience here in a minute but people as you mentioned people are selling things primarily when they're offering uh -huh. this bullshit and i it part of who i am and is the, and I, they always tell you that they're selling something because they're going to save you from big pharma that's making a killing on you right and and that's the thing is like i have this i don't call it a curse or a blessing but i believe people are just good and when i've all, I never talk bad about people. I hate it when people are rude. Like, it's just this this thing. And so when people say Dave Asprey or Food Babe or whatever it might be are making a lot of money off of their opinions, their products, which, as you state, are mostly bullshit or all bullshit, mm -hmm. um, I tend to go, I think their beliefs are in the right place. They're just yes. misguided. Do you agree with that? Or do you think the vast majority of people really go... I don't care. I'm just selling something. It's, I think that in a lot of these cases, these people believe what they're selling 
Um, and I mean, I can't, I, it's very hard to speculate on what's in someone's head. Like you can't tell the difference between a charlatan that absolutely a hundred percent believes what they're doing and someone who's just out to make a killing. And here's the thing at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. They're selling something that's just, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at it and go, are they selling something that's proven or are they selling something that doesn't have any veracity behind it? So if there's no veracity behind it, no matter if they believe in it or if they're just out to make a buck, you have to debunk it and say it's bullshit. Yeah, and I guess that's where I almost see the way we differ is that like, I, I mean, I agree with you, but the difference mm. is I look at it as what is the person thinking and why are they doing it? And that's why I do this podcast, right? That's what I'm trying to get at. And yours is like, I don't care what they're thinking. Guy's probably an idiot anyways. I don't want him spreading this to other people. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, it's hard to speculate on what's in someone's mind. And I try to think, I, I think in a vast majority of cases, these people believe what they're selling. Like, I I want to think the best in people. Like, sure. even the anti-vaxxers, who I, I wholeheartedly 100% disagree with, they're doing absolutely the wrong thing. But in their head, they're the hero of their own story. They're like, I mean, if you thought that injecting your child with this vaccine was going to cause all these horrible things to your child and you were injecting them with toxins, wouldn't you avoid the vaccine too? So, I mean, these people think they're doing the right thing and they're going about it all the wrong way. Absolutely wrong. Right, but, but, in but their, those people... In, in their head. Oh yeah, but, they're... they're they're but, absolutely genuine in their wrong belief. But not only that, if if they have that strong of, of a belief, you have to imagine they've tried to do some research. And if they've but, done some research and still come to that conclusion, then I then I really do lose hope. Yeah, it's well, I mean, it's it's easy to uh, it's easy to lose hope on this. But I mean, every so often I get an email from someone saying, you know, I read your site and I came back around and started vaccinating yeah. my kids. Wow. It happens not very often. But I think uh, it's I, I think the anti-vax movement is and this is something that a few other people have said. The anti-GMO movement is about as pernicious as the anti-vax movement. I mean, right now we have a, a group called USRTK that has sent FOIA requests to and has made a huge smear campaign against about 40 research scientists in the U.S. Uh, I mean, they've they're basically abusing the FOIA system by trying to hold up research and, and harassing these scientists that are doing research on uh, genetic mod anything from genetic modification to breast milk so i mean anything that shows up research that these people just find to be unfavorable they're harassing scientists at this point so uh -huh. it's not about uh the fact that they just don't want to eat gmos or that they want don't want it labeled it's that this it's that i don't like science so i'm going to make sure this thing isn't a thing for anybody else anymore uh -huh. they're just they they refuse to come around to this technology so they're saying uh, i think there's a, that wonderful uh, quote from Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So they're, mm. they're so they're trying to torch it with fire. <laughs> um, and I mean, that's literally what's happened. Like they will say golden rice needs more studies. Uh, and then in one breath and then, then in the next breath, there have been cases of these quote unquote activists burning test fields of golden rice. So does it need more study or do they want to burn it? Right. Wow. Like they just, this thing scares them so much that they're just going to burn it. Um, I know recently there's been a case with my, uh, my good friend, Kevin Folta, who's the head of the horticultural department at the University of Florida. He has been FOIA'd after his, I mean, about 5,000 of his emails were, uh, were grabbed from this FOIA request. And out of 5,000 emails, they managed to take about a dozen statements out of context and make it look like he had some nefarious relationship with Monsanto, which nothing could be closer, uh, or nothing could be farther from the truth. And I, I put a small write-up in my blog about it, but I mean, I can't do everything on it. But from this, uh, his they had to change his department email uh, at University of Florida. Uh, wow. One blog published the name of his graduate students. His family uh, has been her I mean, it's been endless just because they don't agree with the research that he's doing. So it's been it's been pretty horrible to see what some of these activists are doing to really good scientists. So, I mean, whenever I see somebody putting out a new thing, uh, harassing Folta, I put a video that I have of him uh, giving my dog a back massage <laughs> online. I'm like, I'm like, you guys think Folta is a monster here. My dog loves him. My dog loves him. <laughs> I think, well, that's another thing. I think you've struck such a good balance of fact versus enjoyment and 
and or or in yeah, addition to enjoyment, you know, and entertainment. And I think yeah, it's being a bit of a goofball totally helps. Right. Yeah. And that's something that uh, even the guy that I I do this podcast with has kind of helped me on. I think sometimes I steer too much towards like, let's just get to the facts and we should just be able to tell people the facts. And he's, he's more into comedy and he's like, dude, you got to get people to want to listen and read the whole thing in the first place. Well, I mean, and I say this as somebody who used to be a research chemist. Um, when I was like, you know, on my off duty hours, I wasn't sitting at home reading academic papers. I was reading cracks.com and I was, you know, I, I was reading uh, Gawker, you know, which I, which I write for um so like but you know i was reading stuff that made me laugh and gave me a bit of information and it's the same thing with television i think that we can preen a lot in terms of how we package information from what we pay attention to during our off-duty hours i was watching penn and teller's bullshit i was watching south park and i was watching inside amy schumer (laughs) so i mean if you like think about those they give a really fun and you know sometimes serious message and they you know drop f-bombs like they're like they're uh, commas you know Mm -hmm. so i mean i think that if we can look at that and go okay these are giving people a lot of information and they're making them laugh and this is important Uh, how uh, how can we use that type of messaging um to get out you know to continue getting out something serious and i mean penn's a good friend of mine i sat there going okay i want to go after the same type of stuff that he did and i'm going to start just writing on this blog what what can i learn from that um and i i kind of took some of the same things like that's part of the reason i swear so much um is that i don't want to get sued of all things (laughs) because if you say if one were to call someone that they disagree with with a liar, a fraud, or a quack, one could get sued uh-huh. and lose a lot of one's money, and then one could not feed one's science dog. <laughs> um, however, uh, if one calls someone an asshole who sells bullshit, uh, pretty safe territory legally, because wow. that's just an opinion. Uh, wow. And I mean, it was it was funny. I was having a conversation with uh, with Teller once. Yes, he talks. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, Teller said, "Yeah, we got the episode on chiropractic back from legal, and it said just call them mother." What? I mean, it was yeah. So hearing Teller say mother was a wonderful moment in my <laughs> yeah. life. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that's uh, but that's the thing. It keeps them safe legally, and I've kind of learned you know a lot of lessons about how to uh, you know how to make people laugh. And how to, uh, you know, how to keep myself safe legally, you know, at the hands of Penn and Teller. Sure. It's been a wonderful uh, lesson, you know, in, in how, to, uh, how to keep this thing viable and how to make people pay attention to some very important science. So, I mean, like, and people, I do occasionally get poo-pooed by people who are like, oh, if you'd swore less, you'd be more popular. I'm like, really? Have you seen the numbers on my website? Right, yeah. You're <laughs> so like, I'm like, I think look, it's the other way around. I, I'm like, yeah, and I mean, I, I go out and give talks now, and every so often someone will say, you can't swear for this talk. There are going to be college students in the audience. I'm like, they've said f- 30 <laughs> times in the last hour. <laughs> they have heard this language, I promise you. Yeah. But it's like... I'm like, can we just tell them if you're offended by language, don't come? Actually, like, wait, it's... before before I lose this thought, because this is an issue I have had ever since I entered the professional world. And I started off in, in finance, corporate America. And like, I oh, feel dear. like, yeah, exactly. I feel like everyone in there is full of, not full of shit entirely, but like is masking their true self. Yeah, and yeah. and then that makes the, the 1% of us or whatever that have the inability to mask mask ourselves uh it makes us stick out and i always wondered like why do they do that so you worked in office environments and stuff you have good degrees like what are your thoughts on that it's well i mean i think it depended on the uh the place i worked because i worked in one place that uh liked to hire 22 year olds right out of college because they could hire them for cheap Mm -hmm. uh, and train them into whatever they wanted and they i learned the 22 year olds were more likely to report you for just having it never mind uh having an opinion that was slightly different from from theirs telling them that they'd done something you know wrong and i mean this was just while they were still training into the job it's like hey you know you did a good job on this if uh here's something to look out for next 
time. Mm -hmm. How dare you tell them they were not perfect little snowflakes? Mm. Um, so, but I mean, this was like, never mind swear. And I mean, if you did this from then on out, you could tell your behavior was being watched and you were being looked at for possibly showing anything that, you know, wasn't, it's like, you are not one of us, Google gobble one of us, you're gone. <laughs> like, but it was, uh, it, I learned that was kind of something with uh, maybe, and I mean, I don't want to pick on people who are younger than me um, because I think that, uh, that because I mean, I've gone to speak at colleges and I, I think that the students are wonderful. And I think that, um, I, I think that most of them are not offended by people who aren't afraid to stand out. Um, but I think there's always that one or two uh, that, you know, and I think it's, it's symptomatic of being, uh, of being a little new to the workforce, if anything else, that makes you go, people are allowed to say that. What? Um, it's like, yeah, that people are going to have different opinions than you. And then I've been at other labs um, where people were, the ages were all over the place and people realized, oh, there are going to be different perspectives than mine. And that's mm -hmm. fine. And that actually enhances the work experience. And that's, I mean, the, the labs I've worked at where we've had a lot of different uh, age groups and a lot of different uh, perspectives, that's been, I think it's been a richer work environment and having those perspectives all over the place, um, you know, it, uh, different ages, different genders, different races has been kind of a, a much more uh, rich working environment. Mm -hmm. And it's allowed, you know, they kind of, the last lab I worked at, um, like I was, I was one of the younger ones in the lab at the age of 30 when I started working there. And it was, uh, it, it was, they, they basically said, look, we have room for every personality here as long as you have talent. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the lab I worked at before that basically said, we're looking for people who fit in. <laughs> wow. And it was like, it was, and I mean, it was very clear that if you didn't hang out with the bosses on the weekend, you weren't going to get promotions. You were, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty rough. So, I mean, that, so that happens. I mean, yeah. I don't want to deny that that happens in corporate America. So that's, I mean, it was like, after I worked there, I'm like, please just don't let me end up at a place like that again. So, I mean, that, that absolutely happens and it's, it's rough. So, I mean, I, I like, and I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even the swearing that they would get people in trouble with for with. It's like, if they just didn't like you as a, uh, as a person, if they didn't want to hang out with you on the weekends, they would find reason to try to get you to not have a job. <laughs> right. So right. that's, and that's, that's kind of hideous to me. <laughs> well, and so s people are kind of getting this, this, this abstract, I guess, of who you are. So I want to kind of let's yeah. drill into it. Right. Yeah, you exactly. know, they, they've heard like, wait, Psy babe. Okay. She like worked in a lab and uh, bulletproof and food babe are full <laughs> of shit. So, yeah. so let's... let's start from the beginning here. So what, what is in your background that, that says, you know what, we should listen to what she has to say about nutrition and all that. It's, um, I, I, I'm a chemist who likes to swear. Um, no, see, <laughs> let's get a little bit more into it. So I started off with a uh, bachelor's degrees in chemistry and theater chemistry because I like science theater because daddy didn't hug me enough, uh, obviously. Uh, and then I got, I took a year out of school and, and just had a regular old office job. Uh, then went back to, uh, I, I didn't know, like I, there weren't a lot of jobs available in my area at the time the economy was starting to tank. Um, and I, I sat there going, what do I miss? Um, um, and I really had been interested in forensics. So I went back, got my master's in forensics, uh, taught college chemistry for a year. Wait, what then is forensics? I, uh, forensics, it's, I mean, for me, let's see, the program uh, involved, well, for me, it was, um, it, it was concentrating in biological criminalistics. And I did my master's thesis on prescription opiate abuse trends. So uh, wow. forensics, it's really being able to analyze uh, trace evidence uh, from a crime scene is oh, what okay. it comes down to. So Because I've less... heard of forensics. I just didn't know if there were like a, a thousand different versions yeah. or who knows. So, you know? well, some people think it's more about crime scene analysis and that's part of it. Uh, but the big biggest, like I'm, I'm not doing police work. I'm more, uh, you know, being able to analyze trace amounts of chemicals and being able to look at, um, a chemical species and going, okay, I need to be able to, to design a test for it. So being able to, uh, do complex, uh, chemical extractions without destroying evidence is a big part of doing forensics. And I mean, I've done, you know, have had two professional jobs now that have really used those skills from, uh, you know, from that, from that program. And that was the next job that I had, which was, uh, doing explosive, uh, explosives chemistry for a Homeland security contractor. Uh, and that was, that was quite a bit of fun. Uh, and it was designing test plans to, uh, to figure out what the minimum detection level of, uh, needed to, 
be for certain explosives uh, that we need to detect at airports. And I, that's hmm. about all I can say yeah. <laughs> about that one because some classified stuff. Um, but yeah, so after that, I worked uh, at a toxicology lab, uh, and that was the one that I was talking about that liked to hire people right out of school. <laughs> and from what I've gathered, they're they're not doing too well financially anymore. Uh, I don't I don't think I had anything to do with that. <laughs> um, it's by, by which I mean I don't. They uh, it's they got sued for Medicaid fraud, so that um, that will put a damper on your finances. Sounds like a uh, great getting, company. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it was here's that and here's the thing like being a, a rough position to be in is having a good paying job in a shitty economy and hating your job. Oh my god. Cuz like you don't Bingo. you don't want to you don't want to complain to your friends like, yeah, my paycheck is great. I hate my life every day. Like, yep. how do you complain about that? Because like a lot of us at the job were like, yeah, if we left this lab, we'd be making 30 grand less per year. Mm -hmm. Like everything else in the area paid less. Mm -hmm. So it was that horrible trade off of I hate what I'm doing every day. I can pay off my student loans. Right. Like, right. You know, what do you what do you do with that? Um you know, like after um, like four years later, I, I was uh, laid off um, when, you know, they did massive amounts of layoffs when they lost a lot of business. Um, and it was funny. I had a trip scheduled to California, uh, just a vacation scheduled uh, that like, you know, a few weeks after I was uh, after I was laid off. I'm like, what am I going to do with this vacation? I'm an idiot. And I didn't put trip protection on it. Uh, you know, in case I lost my job. Right. So I decided I would send resumes to uh, to companies in the area that I was tr that I was visiting three days before I left uh, AMVAC, the company that I ended up getting a job at. Uh, they called and they were like, do you want to come in and interview the day that you land? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I nailed the interview and got um, in just a few weeks later, I moved out here. Um, and it was, it was a little, uh, scary. I was, um, it was a couple of years ago and I was, um, it was April in Boston. And the day after I got back to Boston, I was at the finish line of the Boston marathon, uh, when the bombs went off. Wait, so that you was, were there? Yeah, I was, I was, I was, cause I used to be, I ran a couple of marathons. So I have a lot of marathoner friends. I had walked a block away, um, when the bombs went off. And that night when we were looking at the maps, um, of where the bombs were, um, I was standing where the second bomb went off for about two hours uh, until, uh, like, until 15 minutes before when my last friend crossed the finish line. So that's one of those moments where you throw up. Like, yeah. I ran to the bathroom and threw up. It oh was horrifying. God. So I, it's, I had a little bit of PTSD from that for yeah. a little while. Yeah. But I mean, it was, it was a scary, uh, scary day. Uh, then, so, anyways, that was my. Uh, that was my last week in Boston of hiding in my apartment, packing up my boxes and moving out to L.A. So the funny thing was when I moved to L.A., everyone said, now don't go Hollywood on us. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> I'm moving out there for a chemistry job. That'll never happen, guys. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, here we are. Look um, at so you now. After, so I moved to work at a pesticide lab. And at that point, I was still like a little, I, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know a lot about agriculture. All I knew was I was a good chemical analyst. Um, and I'm like, okay, it's a job. And I ended up really loving the place I was working at. The company was great. Um, and I learned a lot about pesticide safety and farming. And of course, course at the same time i was seeing people say pesticides aren't tested for safety i'm like are, that's what i do for work what are you talking about so i started because i'm i, I i'm a loud mouth and capable of keeping my mouth shut uh starting a blog uh and saying i'm like yes pesticides aren't tested i i just probably lick the vial say it's probably not going to kill your kids and go back to watching porn for eight hours a day no no no. it's it's just it's just one hour a day two hours max on thursdays only so you know i would say shit like that right uh, and it got people to pay attention you know to what i was uh to what i was doing so i would go out and debunk some of the uh some of the bunk on the internet so it all kind of you know like i had this a bunch of experience working in different types of labs. I knew the regulatory environment that we had for pesticides um, and, and somewhat for GMOs. Um, and I started my blog after about a year and a half of working at the pesticide company. Um, and I started doing a couple of little videos and they, and like my first thing that went a, a little viral uh, was, um, 
was this homeopathy video where I, you know, I pulled a James Randi and downed an entire bottle of homeopathic sleeping pills, kind of as a part of a protest about the fact that they're not labeled very well. Uh, and they're put on the shelves right next to all the regular, all, you know, all the things with real f***ing medicine on yeah. the shelves. Uh, you know, and, and I only had about 10,000 followers at the time. And that video went crazy. It had like over a third of a million views. So, and it just, I mean, I think, I think there were articles about it in like 15 different papers. It was just, it was nuts. And now a quick message from this week's sponsor. Have you heard of Schoolhouse? Schoolhouse is a New York-based and globally inspired brand design agency. When subjective experiences challenge you as an individual, dare you to take creative risks, and ask individuals to define the collective versus the collective defining the individual, life and experience serve as your schoolhouse. This is why Schoolhouse is about finding your brand truth and not just your brand story. At Schoolhouse, it's not only what they do, it's how they do it that makes the biggest impact. Authenticity, collaboration, and expression keep Schoolhouse sharp, excited, and honest about the work they do. They know the value of client relationships based on quality and trust. They are Schoolhouse, the branding brand. Learn more at www.weareschoolhouse.com and follow us daily through Instagram at at schoolhouseNYC. Again, to find out more, go to weareschoolhouse.com today. And now back to the show. So wait, wait. Different online publications. Let's, let's, um, let's stop there because the, I, I find that truly amazing. Did you analyze the pills prior to downing them, given your chemical no. background? You no, just I, said, I, I trust that these are nothing. Well, I also knew that several other people had done the same thing. I'd seen videos of other uh, of other people like debunkers, like James Randi had done the exact same thing. And I know how to read these labels extraordinarily carefully. So uh. like I... There are some types of homeopathic uh, treatments that have a little bit of real medication in them. Sure. And that was, I mean, eventually uh, in January, I did a demo with a homeopathic, of all things, a homeopathic dog medication that was 13% alcohol. What? Yeah, this happened. Did you get uh, wasted? So Oh, f yes, I did. Um, and it was it was funny because like, and I mean, I, I emailed I was really I thought I was very nice to Petco about this. Um, I emailed them back and forth a few times because like I didn't know if this video would backfire on me because right. I'm like, he, like, I barely drink like I mean, it like when I'm when I'm out uh, doing a talk and people offer me a glass of wine, I'm like, no, thank you. Like, it's just I'm it gives me a stomach ache. I'm huh. not a drinker. So like I had I was hurting the next day. Wow. from from this thing that was you know that got me drunk for all of two hours you wow. know i just i'm not a drinker i did not enjoy this experience at all people were like yeah you had a good time i'm like no i didn't i'm all i'm, I'm if alcohol stopped being a thing tomorrow i'd be like whatever <laughs> it's just it's not a thing in my life so i uh so i i you know made a funny little video of me being drunk and being i'm like all right so i'm gonna get drunk on this here we go and you know i was goofing off for t for two hours and of course condensed it down to sure. five minutes worth of clips but here's the thing it said 13 percent alcohol and the alcohol was under inactive ingredients what? Al al alcohol is inactive ask an alcoholic about that ask yeah. a dui a ask an officer who's pulled somebody over for a dui if 13 percent alcohol is inactive so here's the worst part like 13 percent alcohol kids could have walked in and bought it and it just said it's a medication for my dog and gotten drunk on it wow. and it was eight it was all of eight bucks for as much alcohol as i i believe two or three cores lights i was gonna say yeah for sure right they're four percent yeah it was it was i mean it was pretty high of an alcohol content and I, for a decent sized bottle. So I, you know, made a few quote unquote mixed drinks. I mixed it with, uh, oh, with gross. Red Bull and <laughs> I mixed it with Red Bull and called it a dog and, uh, what was it? A bulldog? Um, cause the stuff was called good dog. And they said it oh. made your dog calm down with essences of flowers. No. So okay. I'm like, that's what I was going to ask. What did crazy. it say it did? And it it's, was for it calming. That, cause you get them effed up. It, yeah. I mean, and it said that, you know, pour it into the water bowl and it calms down your dog. Yeah. Because your dog cannot process alcohol like it's wow. so the alcohol processes really slowly causes liver damage uh and they and i mean there were we saw online reviews and of course some people
people said, you know, because you're only supposed to pour a little bit into the water bowl, uh, that, you know, it, the alcohol is negligible. I'm like, yeah, it says to use it as many times as is necessary, though. Right. And we found people reviewing it online saying, I go through two bottles of this a week. Jeez. So there are people causing liver damage in their dogs with this, I'm sure. And of course, Petka said, we have no direct deaths related to this. It's like, yeah, because the death would be slow. Yeah. And Nobody would not- know. Well, and- exactly. And it says an inactive ingredient. People aren't looking at the alcohol. In exactly. This. So, but the video of me getting drunk, and then of course a bunch of my followers uh, sent the video out to reporters, and eventually it got picked up by the news. And Petco, as Petco at first kept digging their heels and saying we have no reported animal deaths or illnesses, we found a tweet from Petco. Um, and I, you know, I emailed the, the reporter from Ross story. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty tenacious when it comes to media uh, type things. I'm like, I will not let a story go if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to get a message out, especially when it's something dangerous. Right. Uh, there was a raw story uh, picked up uh, the, uh, the story on, on Petco and Petco, of course, re- you know, sent a statement back to Ross story saying that no, no debts have been reported from this. We found a tweet from a few weeks before from Petco saying on New Year's, keep your animals away from the alcohol because it's very, it's toxic for your dogs. I'm oh, like, Oh goodness. shit. And that was so damning. Yeah. So we, we, I sent the, uh, you know, I contacted the reporter from Ross story, a uh, very nice guy named Scott. And I'm like, you know, could you, is there any chance you could include this in here? Because this is pretty damning. He included it four hours later, Petco pulled the product and the company that makes the product discontinued it. Perfect. I love it. And see that. Yeah, that I mean, that keeps you going, I'm sure. Yeah, it's like I do, you know, I do some activism that, you know, it's like I know. And here's the thing. Every so often someone will say to me, so you're you're doing the same thing as the food, babe. I'm Uh like, no, this is an actual dangerous product that's really bad for for animals. Um, And, you know, like no matter what I do, someone people are going to compare me to the food, babe. um, And I'm like and I'm not going to be able to stop that, you know, for a very long time. But I'm, I'm only here's here's the difference. The food babe, after she goes after a company, uh, will will still say that their products are too toxic for her. Like after going after Starbucks and they changed their f-ing recipe for PSLs, which is horrifying. Wait, wait, she um, uh, okay? Because that that's one of the articles. Obviously, we want to talk about, but they they actually changed it because of what she wrote. They added. Uh, they actually added. F- pumpkin puree to the coffee to quote dennis leary stop putting shit in the coffee wait wait they they added it to take something else out they took out the caramel coloring and put in Uh, pumpkin puree and i'm like this is crazy wow so and of course here's the thing afterwards the food babe says it's still too toxic for me and then goes on this rant about other things that that starbucks has to change and i'm like oh my god i'm like i'm like this is why you don't negotiate with terrorists (laughs) like these people like it's the, these people are horrible and they're always going to say that your stuff is not organic or perfect or unprocessed enough. Like here's the thing. No, ma- no matter what organic ingredients you put into the goddamn lattes, it's still a 500 calorie milkshake. Yeah. Okay. Oh, like, and I, ca- I, I love uh, a Starbucks. I mean, I'm oh, yeah, a salted a, caramel I, fiend. Like it just is what it is. <laughs> I enjoy them once in a while. Like here's the thing. You're not supposed to have those every day. If your metabolism can't exactly. handle it, yep. like it's, and nobody has ever endorsed drinking these things on a, uh, you know, on, on a daily basis. If you're mm-hmm. someone who's, you know, who's dealing, if you're somebody who uh, cannot maintain a healthy weight, uh, and uh, who's, uh, who, you know, and, and drink these on, on a daily basis, don't, you know, yep. but if you're, uh, you know, if you're somebody who's, who's running on a daily basis or who's, who's, you know, metabolism can handle this, go for it, you know, but I, I look at them as kind of a treat, have two of them a season yeah. and that's about it. I'd but, say I have one a week, but you know, I got, yeah, I, it's, I, I keep oh, in I'm, shape. So it's, I, I, I like to, this is where I joke. I'm in Hollywood now. I can't have it. No, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, well, I kid, I kid, but no, it's so she, uh, the thing about food, babe though, and, and specifically what we're talking about with Starbucks, yeah. I actually had written down because this is one of the things that really, I said, I got to talk to this chick because oh, yeah. you wrote the thing about, um, coffee I, I being wrote, the, the same level of toxin i think or whatever so i wrote some things about the food babe and she does not like me very much well, okay. um, that's fair. i think 
I think she's still cursing the day that I was born. <laughs> um, it's I heard no. I mean, I heard some rumors back from her camp that I, I believe the word was devastated <laughs> that yeah. uh, that was used about her thoughts on this. But of course, she'll never admit that publicly. But a couple, you know, rumors got back to me from people in her little group of of people that she's not was not happy at all mm-hmm. uh, with the fallout of that article because we used to see her everywhere in the news, um, and she used to make appearances on media constantly. She's basically had a media a blackout for a few months. Uh, so huh. I, I think we like, you know, here's, she's always going to be popular in alternative health circles. Sure. We're never going to get rid of her entirely. Like she's, uh, you know, but we can get rid of these charlatans in popular media and that's the best we can hope. So I wrote this article. Um, and it was, here's the thing. This was my first professional piece of writing ever. Like I'd never accepted a, you know, a dime for my writing before. It was just Mm -hmm. all stuff on my blog. So this article on Gawker, um, and I didn't write the title for it. Gawker chooses uh, the titles. Um, It was called, uh, it was called the food babe bloggers full of shit. And oh my God, I love them for using that title. It was was wonderful. Oh yeah. It's, and I mean, it was, it was so much fun uh, to, to work with their editor. Um, it's, her name was Leah Finnegan. She's unfortunately no longer with, uh, with Gawker. And it's, I, I took a brief hiatus from Gawker and now I'm back to doing some work with them again. Um, but there, uh, it was so much fun to work with them on it. And the, the article came out and with, within six, and I didn't know what to expect. I thought maybe I'll get a few thousand new followers on my blog, on my, uh, on my website. It's some, some new, uh, it's a new audience. We'll see what happens. Um, And within six hours of the article coming out, I had, I think, 20,000 new followers on Facebook and the article had hit a million views. Wow. Uh, Within a week, I had broken 100,000 followers and the article was at about 4.5 million views. It was just nuts. Like I, uh, I was getting 300 emails a day. I, um, I, I'd signed, I signed a book deal two days after the article came out. Like it was, I mean, my, my life went crazy that week. I, I, and nobody, nobody tells you how to prep for when your life goes viral. Like there's, so, I mean, I, there was, it was funny. My mom had a vacation scheduled out here to visit uh, and she, you know, booked that flight like two months before. So I'm, you know, I, I had to pick my mother up at the airport on either the Friday or the Saturday and I'm sitting there, you know, emailing back and forth to Bostino magazine and to the LA times to, you know, finish up some of my interviews at, over breakfast. And she's looking at, my mother's looking at me across the table going, Yvette, your hash browns are getting cold. Like, but like all, all like I'd woken up at seven thirty that morning to do one interview, and all I'm doing is just going back and forth. Like I'd done five interviews in two days. Sure. And like, I was just like by uh, at the end of that two week stretch, I had a talk at the Center for Inquiry, and the night after that talk, I slept for thirteen hours. It oh, was yeah. just it, oh my god, I was so tired. Like. The uh, I, I think at some point in that two week span, um, the, the one of those nutty little moments was like I was because I saw like my Twitter just any time I went through to check my notifications when I went back up to the top of the notifications there were fifty new ones. Right. Like I'm like this must be what it's like to be Taylor Swift every day. Like <laughs> it's you know like you have that many millions of followers it's like oh the notifications just keep coming. Yeah. So I'm like it's there's no way they see everything but it's like that's just that that's what it's like when you go viral and you're a normal person. <laughs> right. So. But like it was uh, it was crazy. Uh, I went to see like who my new followers were and I was just looking for blue check marks to see, uh, you know, if anybody that I knew was following. Uh, I had been watching the show House while because I, like, I like uh, background noise while I'm wa- while I'm uh, writing. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd been watching House while I was writing the article. Hugh Laurie started following me. What? <laughs> so, what? I mean, that was. That was one of those crazy little meta moments in my life. I'm like, what? He knows who I am. Um, and it was, I was, I just thought that was crazy and well, wonderful. And I, to- I totally screamed when I saw that. And well, like, the, the, I was, the thing sorry, is, like, well, I wanted to talk about that article a little bit because if, I think so, the reason it caught on so well is because there was such clear, mind boggling statistics yeah. and and the one oh, yeah. that i that that oh yeah they mentioned the coffee yeah uh, can, can you tell so, me like what yeah. what her argument was what your counter was because i read that and i said boom 
Yeah, it's well, here was the thing. She said that the caramel color used in it, caramel color level four, it's the worst level. And it's it's uh, it's group 2B. Uh, car she's like, it's a group 2B carcinogen, and they use two doses. I'm like, oh, you have. I'm like, whenever you hear somebody who's not a toxicologist trying to play outside of their sandbox, you know there's some bullshit going on here. So, you know, I worked uh, for four years in a toxicology lab, and my master's thesis was on uh, opiate toxicology. I know my toxicology terms really well. So when someone go starts going on about something being toxic uh, and they're a food blogger with no training and their background is in, in computers and management, I'm like something, there's something up here. And she calls everything toxic. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, there's, there's something, there's some bullshit here. So she called it carcinogen class 2B. Do you want to know what else is in carcinogen class 2B? Mm -hmm. The coffee in the cup. <laughs> because of the acrylamide that's accumulated during the roasting pro process. Now, here's the thing, being in carcinogen class 2B doesn't mean that it's ever been shown definitively to cause a case of cancer. It means that it might possibly, it just means we have not ruled it out 100% as a possible carcinogen. Mm. Uh, but like it, it doesn't definitively cause cancer in, in humans. Uh, it's like these things have not caused a case of cancer ever. So, I mean, this thing is pro I mean, it doesn't mean that this thing is a bastion of health that mm -hmm. is, that's, you know, that it's, it's not f***ing vitamin C, right. but at the same time, it's the dose is what's important. So we're, we have such a low dose of both the acrylamide from the coffee and the caramel color that it's fine. Hmm. So you have to look at the dose when you're talking about something being toxic. But I think if she's talking about this, um, you know, she's talking about this horrible, nefarious chemical, uh, caramel color being in carcinogen class 2B, uh, then, and that's the reason to take it out, then why is she even drinking coffee in the first place? Right. And that, that was a home run for me. And then when you mentioned the thing about water, you know, you oh, called yeah. it by its whatever name, Dihyd molecular it's, name. Uh, it's, it's, there, well, there are two ways you can do it. There's the IUPAC name, which is oxidane, and people don't uh, use that one as often, but there's also uh, dihydrogen monoxide because literally two hydrogen uh, atoms and on, one, one oxygen, oxygen sure. uh, atom. And that's, it's funny, there's a, a new website out uh, or a new Facebook page uh, called Dihydrogen Monoxide Awareness, and their memes are just killing it. And they, <laughs> it's kind of a, it's a wonderful satire page that's basically satirizing all these different pages that are just fear mongering about chemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're going through, if it does this, if water does this to your pipes, imagine what it's doing to your stomach. Um, <laughs> you know, there's water, there's water in orange juice and there's water in bleach. Who, who can you, how can you trust Tropicana? Um, you know, it's like, but they're going hardcore on these, on the types of fear mongering uh, that these people do saying, you know, it's like, well, there's azitocarbonamide, uh, you know, in, in yoga mats and bread. How, how is bread not a, uh, not a yoga mat? Like they're going after these types of people who use chemical fear mongering. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, and it's wonderful to see that they're pointing out that everything is a chemical because life is made up of chemicals, um, you know, and certain chemicals need to, there are, there are very few chemicals uh, that are still on the market that, that I would say, you know, to avoid or that are, that are available in high enough doses that can hurt you. But, you know, like the, one of the great examples is Tylenol. I mean, you, two pills of Tylenol, great fever reducer, uh, good for certain types of pain um, that I, and I would absolutely recommend in certain situations. 40 pills of Tylenol, uh, you're going to be really yellow in your casket. Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. You know, it's and that's horrible for you. So, I mean, chemicals have certain, you know, doses and certain times and places they should be used. Uh, but, you know, water, like I said, another example, six liters of water can, all at once can kill you uh, from hyponatremia. Basically, you, uh, you get um, your water and salt balance gets too far off. And one of the funny things is that marathoners are one of the more likely groups to get it uh, because they'll they'll keep hydrating, but their salt their salt comes uh, out during in their sweat. And I mean, mm -hmm. I got a, a tiny little touch of hyponatremia the last marathon I ran uh, because it was the day after a half marathon, and I didn't get enough salt back in my system. Wow! Uh, so that was not smart. But moving on. Um, the uh, one of one of the other things I like to use is uh it's because I'm I can rant about toxicology all day I'm sorry no uh, I can, want to but it's, it's here's a well the last one I'll use I pr I promise is uh the term death by chocolate you can actually and it takes a lot but uh the chemical that's bad for the comp the component that's bad for dogs in chocolate mm -hmm. uh theobromine can kill a human but you just need a load of chocolate right you need 
You would need 90 pounds of milk chocolate, but I'm not a quitter. I, I was... <laughs> I was going to say, that's, don't, don't test that, me. I love my yeah, chocolate. That's, that, that is totally how I want to go out. Like if I find <laughs> out that I'm, you know, dying of, of cancer when I'm in my eighties, I'm going to be like, get, fetch me the 90 pounds of chocolate. <laughs> like that's, that's my plan. I'm just going to go out with chocolate. But see, so. I think, I think what the, the nerve that you're hitting in the public is, is really one that all joking aside is there is this need to understand because there it's it appears that we are suffering from more cancers more bizarre diseases more where you know these these really terrible things and we're also getting less polio you know we're getting we're we're not dying in childbirth as much anymore uh we're not we're not getting kicked in the face by a horse uh that we need to drag us that, that we need to drive oh, us sure. to town anymore no no, no don't so, get me wrong i mean i understand I the longer we live we're going to i mean just by the uh, being human and what happens oh, to yeah, us but, we're going to age and die but is there a way or is there any link between the modern environment with between the chemicals, chemicals and, 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 and radiation and cell phones and all this stuff you know and people's fear and then what you see i have to answer that question very carefully because i know i can be taken out of context on this if somebody you know listens to the show and they're on the other side and they go i have the, I, you know she said yes well mm -hmm. here's the thing yes and no uh, because there is a link between modern medicine and uh, getting cancer. The link is modern medicine keeps you alive long enough to get cancer. Mm -hmm. Because in societies where people live, you know, uh, on average past the age of 70, 75, uh, your, your odds of getting cancer goes up. It's just the longer people live sure. in any society, the odds of getting cancer goes up. And it's because, and I mean, I know this sounds a little grim, but, you know, we're not going to live forever. Something is going to eventually kill you. And the more it's just linked to age, the longer you live, more likely you are to get cancer. So, I mean, it's not the, uh, it doesn't appear at this point to be, uh, you know, to, to be anything in the environment. It's very rare that it's something specifically in the environment. Now, the, uh, the way that I've seen it just from the more, you know, more and more doctors that I've spoken with, you know, it's just as, as I like to say, you know, get your fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, move, you know, get enough movement in your life. Don't smoke. Don't stay out in the sun too, you know, too much. Don't, you know, don't, don't sunbathe. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause that's, that's a really good source of melanoma right there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and hope that your genes don't f with you uh, because you know like a lot of a lot of cancers are just genetic so there are ways right. you can kind of push back on genetics a little bit you know like I said keeping you know keeping your weight healthy not smoking not sunbathing uh, but you know sometimes you know genetics are going to eventually catch up with you uh, if you don't take care of the rest of your health sure well and is there any link I mean so for example I just saw on the news yesterday and I've seen this before um, the playing on artificial turf and the rubber that they use, the thing with rubber on the turf, did you see that? Oh, no, I did, I, it was a different one that I saw. I saw it was from the American, like it was from the uh, the Council of uh, Gynecological. It was, a, it was a study that came out in, uh, in a gynecological group. But here's the thing. They didn't actually conduct a study. They just put a bunch of papers together and said that a certain number of deaths per year were specifically attributed to uh, to environmental toxins, mm. I'm like w I'm like no, mm. this is not like. And I mean, they took so many things out of context, um, and some of the quotes in there debunk themselves. So I mean, for the, my next blog entry, I'm probably going to go hard after this one. Uh, but it's like it, it's this new study that just very very uh, chemophobic and doesn't. Of course, it doesn't even link in the uh, in the article that talked about the study didn't even link to the study. Um, so I mean, it's it's hard for. I mean, whenever you see something that says these, oh. these toxins are doing this and they're not tested they're some bullshit now let's take a break for a moment from our sponsor this week this episode is brought to you by lynda.com the only learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business technology and creative skills for a free 10-day trial visit lynda.com slash smart people that's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash smart people lynda.com is for you for listeners of this show it's the problem solvers the curious people who want to make things happen maybe you want to master excel learn how to negotiate build that new website or boost your photoshop skills go to lynda.com 
and feed your curious mind. There's a few courses I really recommend on there, one being Growth Hacking Fundamentals. Another new one I just checked out is Learning to Be Assertive and Going Paperless Start to Finish. There's so many benefits to a lynda.com membership, such as watching and learning from top experts, streaming thousands of videos on demand, and learning at your own pace. Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, anything you can think of, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to try something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash smart people and sign up for a free 10-day trial. It's free. Why not? That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash smart people. Now back to the show. Actually, as you mentioned that, the study thing, I think the way I found you, I'm not positive, but it threw through the internet randomly, oh dear. is I read this article talking about uh, Bulletproof Diet, right, Dave Asprey, oh dear. or in Bulletproof Coffee. Yes, this is what it was, I believe. And, and it turns out that the guy who used to do the research for him uh, quit because oh. Dave Asprey told him to find studies backing up some claim. And then when the guy, who's the researcher, couldn't find the studies, <gasps> he said, just find studies that have the name of this in it, and we'll include <gasps> those because people never read the studies anyways. What? Yeah. Oh, you haven't Holy seen this? Okay, I got to send oh, this send to you. Oh, send this over to me. Oh, absolutely. It's, yeah, at, after, after we get off this, because I need to post this on my site. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and that changed like everything for me, because to be honest now, I never ordered Bulletproof Coffee because it's expensive as hell. It's, and I've heard people say it tastes good, but as I like to tell people, it tastes tastes good but like it's not penis enhancing coffee guys <laughs> right like, because if it was the... trust me no <laughs> oh yes it was funny i'm writing i'm f writing my book right now um and it's i'm like as soon as man figured out how to sell things man figured out how to bullshit joe i invented fire what's it do it lights things what else does it do it cooks food what else does it do uh makes your penis bigger soul <laughs> like that's i'm sure that's how it happened absolutely but it's like how do we survive in this environment then like really, how do we survive? Because demand, as a non toxic proof. But as a non toxicologist, when I pick up food that I want to eat, but I can't pronounce the label, <laughs> now I realize that that because I work for a nonprofit oh, that deals with healthy food, I, I realize I'm I think I know more than the average, but I definitely don't know yeah. as much as you. What what do I do? Like well, as I like to tell people, base most of your diet on fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and you'll be okay. And I know that's hard for a lot of people, uh, you know, and I never say fresh fruits and vegetables because frozen is just as good. Yep. Uh, I and frozen yep. actually is better in a lot of cases in terms of the nutritional profile uh, because they pick them at the peak of ripeness and flash freeze them uh, so that they keep all the nutrients right there. So frozen, just as good. I love frozen berries. They're wonderful. Um, keep some in the freezer all the time. Uh, but you know what? It's, I know they're expensive. Some Sometimes hard to access, uh, but you know, get get your fruits and veggies uh, before anything else. Uh, as for those ingredients that you can't pronounce, mm. everything is tested very carefully before it gets onto the market. And I know people hear reports that these things aren't tested. There's not enough oversight. Um, I used to work at a pesticide company, and I saw how much regulation there was in terms of how, getting things onto the market and how hard it was to get a new pesticide uh, onto the market. There, I mean, there are certain types of testing, GMP testing testing, which is good manufacturing practices. And then there's GLP, which I worked under good laboratory practices, where you basically have to write down when you throw out a glove. Um, I mean, it is hard to get anything by this. And I mean, not just the laboratory technician who's testing it or the, the chemist who's designing the test, but like this will go through three other chemists, you know, the VP of your company, uh, you know, three different people at the EPA or the FDA. So, I mean, there is a lot of oversight before something new goes onto the market. So so as I like to say, just because you can't pronounce it doesn't mean it's not safe. I mean, it's if that were the case, how would you ever eat when you go to a country where you don't speak the language? No, I mean, and, and I get that. Yeah, but one, I, one example, though, and, and again, like MSG, for example, that, you know, when you say things have been tested forever, isn't that just really isn't that bad for you? It's I, I, I hear that question all the time. It's it's really not as bad as we initially thought. 
um, or as, as people initially like to claim. Hmm. Now, I mean, it's, I know there, there are people who go back and forth on this, um, that, you know, if you have high blood pressure uh, and salt affects or sodium affects your blood pressure, you might not want to have too high of a quantity of it. But other than that, it doesn't seem to be this bastion of awfulness. Doesn't that it like kill brain cells or something? No, no, <laughs> that's just no, that's just silliness. Huh. Uh, but no, it doesn't. It's whenever you see like a little meme online saying MSG causes and then like a list of things like it causes your spleen to turn radioactive and it causes your <laughs> hair to fall out and it causes MS like symptoms. No, huh. oh my God. Now, some people I know might have a hypersensitivity to it. You occasionally yes. find someone my dad who does. says. Yeah, I mean, a, an absolute like hypersensitivity or an allergy because allergies are things we get those. Yes. Uh, but, you know, all these crazy symptoms that people claim are just the MSG. Like I, I have friends who uh, who keep, a, uh, you know, a container of MSG on their shelf you know, for seasoning. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a really good flavor enhancer. It's, you know, it can be used sparingly alongside with salt, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, like I said, kind of as a, a bit of a, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, a different, uh, it's what's the word for it. It's a, it's a little bit of a different flavor enhancer alongside with salt, you know, use in moderation. Don't, don't use it all the time, but you know, I've even seen Alton Brown who, uh, who seems kind of anti-chemical sometimes say MSG has gotten a bad rep and it's good to use, uh, in cooking. So I, yeah. I think that it's the, the chemical, you know, fear mongering. Oh my God, it has three syllables. What am I going <laughs> to do? Like it's, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it in, like I said, in, in moderation. moderation, like, we, but I mean, we, we do get too much salt in our diet sure. on average as Americans. Like I, when I was marathon running, um, I, I think I read somewhere that, uh, runners could, uh, could sweat out like three to five teaspoons of salt a day. I was like, yes, <laughs> I can eat all the salt I want. Oh, and I totally did. Well, you know, the but, thing that's interesting about MSG, my sister-in-law is Chinese. Her parents are, you know, first immigrants, like they came from China and all that. And we were at this party that they threw and they had these different spices and stuff on the table. They and we started, had they had a, a friggin' like yeah, bucket of MSG. Oh, yeah. And that's it's, what have... one of the things like my dad did have a, a an actual allergic reaction, nothing oh, deadly, no. but he knew, I mean, we all were like, wow, like rash, heat rash, et cetera. And it was MSG. So, yeah, so it, that I mean, can happen. I, an allergic reaction to something is absolutely totally. a viable thing, but it's not like, that's the thing. I have a friend who's allergic to chicken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> poor friend. Have, we, yeah. Oh yeah. She's not, she, she, she can't do chicken and turkey. Oh. So, I mean, she's really not happy come Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, do we, do we ban? And chicken because one person's allergic to it. Sure. Oh, you right. Know, yeah. It, yeah. Do we, do we ban MSG because some people have reactions to it? No. I mean, there are also a very tiny percentage of people that have, and I mean, they test for this at birth, mm -hmm. um, a type of reaction to aspartame. Uh, but, you know, most people, huh. and aspartame, because so many rumors came out about it, is now one of the most studied substances on earth. Wow. Um, and it's, you know, one of the most studied kind of artificial substances on earth. It's fine. And I mean, the American Diabetic Association has come out and said safer than sugar. So, I mean, what? and I love one. I, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm wait. We have to pause. And this is why. <laughs> no, we have to pause. This is why. Yeah. So I, I believe. You've heard some rumors. <laughs> no, no, no. No rumors. The, the, actually, I here's my mindset on most of these things. I'm smart. Okay? I don't care what anybody thinks. I feel like I'm smart. So what I do is. You seem pretty smart. Yeah. So. I, I, you know, and I You seek, don't like Dave Asprey and you like me, so I'll, I'll, yeah. give, you, I'll give you smart. And I seek out opinions of others that know more and tend to be fairly <laughs> trustworthy. So. When things happen, like um, when they like trans fats, for example, when they say like, oh, don't eat fat, like we're going to do zero fats and all this. I'm like, that seems weird to me. I'm going to still eat my bacon. Like, I feel like fat is OK yeah. and, and blah, 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 in moderation. And budget. to me, honestly, sugar that tastes like sugar or, or things that taste like sugar and aren't and are zero calories and all that. I think at some point in the future, they will say this stuff kills you now. It's, that, no, that, that, I understand. I understand. See that what I'm suspicion. saying. Now, I hearing totally, this from I mean, you, I, I will now look into look it more, into it. and I will I, probably I take your word for it. No, it was funny because I read something that partially changed my thinking on it and made me look into it more. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, you know, these collection when people say artificial sweeteners are all bad for you, these artificial sweeteners all have different chemical structures, mm -hmm. and the main thing they have in common is that they just have this structure that makes them taste sweet 
to your tongue. Mm. So they're not, it's not that they all are exactly alike. They don't have, they, they're not derived from the same thing. They don't, they don't have chemically similar properties. They just all have this strange little property that to humans, they taste sweet. Hmm. So I, I think when people go, oh, artificial sweeteners, they're all bad for you. It's like, okay, can you tell me what about their structure makes them bad for you? Oh, absolutely not. And, and people generally cannot. Now, aspartame does, like I said, small percentage of people have an allergy to it. Sure. Um, but I mean, it's not a people like, and you'll see people say we've linked MS like symptoms or whatever. They've done so many studies to make sure that this isn't the case. And it's totally not. Now, I mean, I, at one point uh, I was a few years ago, part of what got me very skeptical was I fell for a lot of the BS that I now debunk. I got very, very sick. Um, and I always ask people, what's the worst headache you've ever had? Um, and how long did it last for? And most people, when I ask that say somewhere between three days and two weeks. So what's the longest headache you've had? Actually, fairly recently, and it's been oh. about five days. Yeah, it's a sinus yeah, infection. So, but so so I've had a headache uh, since March seventh of twenty ten, and if I weren't on medication, it, it would still be here right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's I'm on uh, I'm on two medications. One is a seizure medication called Topamax, and one is an anti-inflammatory called Indesin. But the first eight months uh, were hell. Like, because wow. we hadn't figured out the right meds, we hadn't figured out the right dosage or combination. It was, I mean, just every day of my life, I was crying at work. Oh. I was just, it, it was, it was awful. Um, so here's, I mean, and at that point, even though I was working with my doctor and a neurologist to figure out, you know, what was wrong, what, you know, what the, what the, the underlying cause was and what meds to work with. Of course, I was looking at health blogs mm -hmm. and I was looking at food blogs to figure out what I'd possibly done to cause this to myself. Like I fell for all the BS that I debunk now. Of course, it was the aspartame or it was the GMOs or it was sure. the pesticides. And eventually when we figured out the underlying cause and meds that, uh, that, that made it you know, manageable, all the BS kind of went away. Cause I was like, Oh, I can eat conventionally grown produce and my headache doesn't get worse. Oh, I don't have to eat vegan and my headache doesn't get like all these things kind of went away when I figured out they were just trying to sell me something wow. like, and I mean, of course they would argue that big pharma was selling me something too. I'm like, yeah, but big pharma made me better. Like, <laughs> I, just I'm like without, say, I feel with, better now. Yeah. Without big pharma at this point, I, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. I, and I mean, I, I hate to say this like on, on the I show, I probably going. would have killed myself right. by now. Right. Uh, Cause like you cannot deal with that much pain every single day. Sure. Like you can deal with it to a point, but looking at like, women in my family live to be in their nineties uh, as long as they don't smoke basically. Like I, I, I was looking at another 60 years of my life every day in the worst of, of, of the worst pain of my life. Sure. So it was, it would have been horrible, but you know, like big pharma definitely screws up. I'm, I am not going to say that they don't, right. but they also, uh, you know, they also test their cures and they also test their treatments um, and they have to prove efficacy and safety. And now things get through the cracks once in a while and it's horrible, but they do recalls when mm -hmm. they, uh, when, when there are problems. Hmm. And I think recalls prove that the system works. Now the system to get things onto the market and people will argue one way or the other, um, that, you know, the system doesn't move fast enough or it moves too slowly uh, because phase three trials, they test in 10,000 people uh, to see what the allergies are and what the bugs are. But, you know, even with 10,000 people, you don't know what the drug's going to be like in a million people because you don't yeah. know what those other interactions will be and you don't know what those people's underlying conditions will be. So that's why we see problems once it gets, you know, or different problems when it gets into the population, um, even after 10, 15 years of research on a drug. Well, you know, what's interesting is because I actually had it written down. One of the things that bothers me about just kind of following the science in general is I do feel like it lags. Sometimes it lags almost common sense and common knowledge. And, and so I feel like, but now as you talk about it, I go, yeah, it lags because they want to get it right. And so yeah. that's just sometimes difficult. Like you'll hear about something for the first time. Like uh, there recently I read about a berry of all things that they found, I think in the North coast of Australia that when applied topically to animals on tumors that had not spread yet, it could cure the tumors. Now they had to do a few chemical processes to a compound in this berry. So it wasn't just apply berry tumor goes away. <laughs> but I mean, we do look to nature for our cures quite a bit because there are so many compounds in nature that can be used, but you have to, you know, you have to extract it. You have to figure out what the dosage is. You have to, you know, do some things with this natural compound before saying it cures things. But now we have to figure out, is it toxic to humans? Uh, can it be 
used? Uh, can can it be used in a way that works mm-hmm. um, and, and is and is you know as uh, you know a, a, as good in in human trials as it has been in animal trials? So things take time to make sure that we're not poisoning people uh, with with this cure. So mm-hmm. I think people don't see the background on research before it gets out. Like you know, people will always bring up things like you know thalidomide. That was before we knew uh, a lot of these things that we know now, and that was before we have all of the regulations in place that we do now. Things are so heavily regulated at this point that, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes it holds up research getting out as soon as it could, but that's kind of, that keeps consumers really safe. Hmm. So it's, I'm, you know, it's not, things aren't perfect, but things are better than they've been before on, on some levels. So I, I think there are still issues in the pharmaceutical industry. Absolutely. But, you know, we're getting a, we get life-saving medications out. Like I know, like my brother has lupus uh, and he, uh, if he'd gotten lupus 65 years ago, it would have been within the, the average person died within five years of their diagnosis. Uh, he's expected to live a long, healthy life now, just has to take a couple medications every day. Oh yeah. So, and I mean, same thing with, with me having, these headaches like I just have to take two meds and get on with my life it's less than one percent of my day well and I think almost everyone either has that similar story themselves or somebody extremely close to them and I think that is one thing we tend to forget right it's like all of this research and the study and the people in place that are creating the drugs or the foods that you know for example like you were talking about the golden rice that might not be the the best solution on the planet but they are right now um, yeah. We forget it is still the best alternative and it is yeah, a like, step in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, it's whenever there are so many times I'll hear somebody say, um, we have more people now living with chronic disease. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's because once upon a time, if somebody got what we now call a <laughs> chronic disease, they would die. Yeah. We didn't have chronic disease a hundred years ago because we had dead people a <laughs> hundred years ago. Like it's chronic disease means people get up, take their meds, get on with their day. Right. So, I mean, we've made, and I mean, the the line from alternative medicine is always, we treat the body, not the symptoms. I'm like, in other words, you treat nothing. You treat Uh. nothing. You claim that you're looking at the whole body, but they don't have the right testing. They're not using the same methods. They're not going at this thing scientifically at all. And it's nuts that they can claim any of these things. But it's, you know, what, uh, there was a great line from, uh, from Tim Minchin, you know, what do you call alternative medicine that works? medicine. medicine. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, like as soon it's, I don't think they can have it both ways where they say that, you know, medicine and big pharma is just out to make a profit and then sell these unproven treatments, uh, and say that, you know, they're not, you know, for a, a whole ton of money and, and say that they're, you know, just in it for your health. I'm like, you know what, if these things worked, big pharma would find a way to make a profit off of it. I yes, promise you. Yes. And that is a good way of looking at it. I know we got to let you go. And before we do, so for everyone that's listening and enjoys this, the website is Cybabe, okay? Yep. And we there are so many things I even had written down, but it would take Aww. a day of talking about, and and it just is what it is. You can you can hunt me down again. Don't yeah, worry. I will. And and just to give everybody an idea, it's like what does fresh mean? What does farm fresh mean? Let's talk about GMOs, gluten. I love your take on gluten. One of my uh, more recent blog entries on uh, it's called First World Gluten um, is uh, is on my blog. Oh, There's I read a great it. Write up on that. It's oh, fantastic. Yeah, that was, I love it. That was. I edited that one with my old editor from Gawker and it was a lot of fun to write. So I recommend all these things before we let you go though. I want to ask you the final word on organic and specifically organic (sighs) meats, because I am the person that says, you know, like maybe the dirty dozen, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. But when it comes to red meat specifically, I eat and want organic. Am I, uh, is that good or am I wasting money? I think you're probably wasting no, money. No, that's but, not but, possible. But, 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 not possible. But, 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 but I always tell people, if somebody makes a product that you think tastes good, go, go ahead and buy it. You know what? You're still supporting a farmer. Uh, but with organics, um, you're here's the thing. You're kind of buying uh um, Hummer style farming in a Prius style economy. So you're buying something that takes up much more land is actually polluting a little more. And in most cases now, every pesticide that's on the market now is, is safe and isn't going to hurt you uh, by the time you get it. Now, organics still use pesticide on the feed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, a lot of people don't want to think about that. Uh, and it's still, uh, you know, it's like by the time it gets to you, whether it's organic or conventionally grown, there are still pesticides being used. Um, and in a, a lot of cases with organic, the pesticides have to be applied more often at a higher cost to the farmer and the pesticides are more toxic and less effective. 
You know, so this I, is there. And I mean, people don't see this because organic or, here's the line from organic. They say uh, they, they say that um, that we don't use any of those synthetic pesticides and people just forget the word synthetic is in there. Mm-hmm. And they think it means we don't use any pesticides. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they use pesticides. And that's here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with that because they're definitely they're, they're using them in a dose accurate amount. Um, I just want people to realize that both of these use pesticides. And by the time it gets to your plate, both of them are safe. Now, as for if grass-fed beef is tastier and worth the cost, if you think it's worth the cost, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. You're still supporting a farmer. Mm. So I, I want you to, you know, use your, you know, at some uh, point, uh, at some point, me. Oh, it's, you know what? At some point, do a uh, do a blind taste test. Get both, uh, cook them for an equal amount of time, same seasonings, and just do a blind taste test for yourself. See if it's going to be worth the cost for you. And I, I'm not. I always say, go ahead and support whichever farmer you want because you're still supporting a farmer. But don't put yourself through that uh, through that financially if you don't want if you don't have. Yeah, to. but like cows that aren't organic, they stand in their own shit. And like, I feel like, and again, I'm not, I'm not actually as well versed as I should be, but. The, I feel like the organic ones, they live on this beautiful farm. It's, <laughs> did, did, did you ever think that that might be marketing too? Yeah, I'm kind of being facetious here, are, but you know what I mean. No, no, it's like it's okay to think that because that's the image they give you. The, some of the organic farms, because I don't want to get sued, some of the organic farms are just as big – uh-huh. Uh, and are just as, you know, kind of mass produced. It's just they use organic feed. Like, look really carefully into what these labels mean. But, you know, it's I, there are very few of them that have big pastoral, uh, you know, farms uh, that that are the image that they present to you. Uh. So it's, you know, I, I want you to I want you to think carefully about it. Now, when you hear grass fed and those are the ones that cost a fortune. Right. I've had grass fed before and it, it tastes pretty damn good. Mm-hmm. So it's, I you know, I'm not gonna I, i'm not gonna begrudge you uh that you know if it's uh you know if it's something that you're um that, that you want to that, that you think there's a taste difference on but in terms of nutritional value it's the same uh, so that's you know that's what i'm here to bust is is you know if someone says there's science saying that it's better for you there you know there really isn't but if you think it tastes better i, I can't bust you on that you know but you know give it you owe it to yourself to try out a blind taste test and if you still think it tastes better keep keep buying it I like do. i'm not i never want to tell somebody not to buy something that tastes better i have friends who totally don't buy into the organic thing at all and say that they think organic milk tastes better and they've tried to talk themselves out of it and they're like no i just like the taste i'm like hmm. then buy it you know you're still supporting a dairy farmer so i don't want to uh, tell someone not to buy something they think tastes good uh now now i got it i'm gonna spend the rest of the afternoon digging into organic <laughs> stuff because milk milk especially it's like six dollars a gallon for organic and three for not and i mean that that can add up so yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, I. It, uh, the funny thing is, I mean, for all the uh, for all the woo that I don't buy into, I I totally buy uh, almond milk. Um, yeah, and I know I that do that's. Too, and given that I I live in California, and I mean, I was a vegan for two years while I was trying to figure out what was wrong with my health, and then we found out one of the underlying issues I had was celiac disease. And right. after after I got diagnosed with celiac. Uh, I just all the food issues went away because I was like, nope, this is the only thing I can't have. Everything else is stuff that I was told that was toxic. It's just the wheat, Um, especially for me. Uh, It's every or let me rephrase that. Everyone else who thinks gluten's the devil, uh, who just you know bought into the gluten sensitivity stuff, please, Mm. it's not real. The gluten (laughs) sensitivity stuff is bullshit. I promise you. Yeah, and you talked about that on the blog. It was one thing I uh, wanted to get into. We didn't, but just go read the article. It's all. Yeah, it's exactly. It's have me back on sometimes. We'll Uh, we'll chat about this more. So. But yeah, All right. uh, I don't know if you have to if we have to go now. But if we I do, do I got a, was, unfortunately yeah. another interview. <laughs> no. Cool. All right. It was, that, anyways, it was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you right. so much. Cybabe is the website. Where? What's your Twitter? Just so people can check you out there. Let's see. Both Twitter and Instagram are at the Cybabe, and my Facebook page is facebookcom slash Cybabe. All right, and we will link to that at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Yvette, thank you so much. Um, I will shoot you an email with the link to that article I found about Bulletproof because it blew my mind. Oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Excellent. All right. All right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Great. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Yvette. That was definitely a fun one. Really do hope you enjoyed that. I tried my best to catch all the F-bombs and edit those out. But if I didn't, I apologize. Some may have slipped through the cracks, but I swear... I tried. And that's all that really counts, right? If you enjoyed the episode or any episode before this, please head over to iTunes or Stitcher and leave a rating and review over there. 
It really does help out the show, helps us continue to get great guests. So any review you can leave over there, we truly do appreciate. If you'd like to reach out to the show, shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or send us a message on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. If this is your first time listening to the show, please make sure you subscribe and check out smartpeoplepodcast.com to see all the great interviews we've done in the past. We've got some great interviews coming up. Stay tuned, and we will see you next week. <laughs>